this week I'm starting something I'm calling Bad Religion. Um, now, this is a series that I have just been praying about for a long time as I've watched a society change through um, different things that are happening in our culture, um, especially America, we find that um, even n not just the, the secular world and the spiritual world are entrenched in battle towards one another. We are discovering more and more that even there are, are distinctions between Christians. And there are distinctions between the kind of church people belong to. There are distinctions between our view of God and our view of Jesus and what spirituality really is. And it is creating a big problem. It is creating a big problem and it is causing um, divisiveness. It is causing things to fall apart. And so I know that there are elements of tradition, elements that are important to our Christian faith that we absolutely participate in. Now, I understand that religion has been seen in a bad way you know, a bad view, but we also know, and, it, and it's, you know, it's translated this way, but in the book of James, um, James talks about pure religion, and he talks about caring for widows and orphans, and so we know that religion is something that, that, you know, we can't avoid in conversation when we're talking about our faith, and we're talking about Christianity, but there are definitely different um, expressions of religion that a word that we use in, in, um, in the church is uh, legalism, being controlled or, or constrained by this having to live or having to operate a certain way, even immediately at times. Now, <clears throat> a quick story. When I was first pastoring here, I had a friend. His name is Bill. He's all the way in Ohio, and there was this guy who was passing through, visited his church, and they had talked for a little bit, and this guy had... Uh, said to Bill, you know, he, Bill was asking him where he was going, and, and this guy said, well, I'm actually heading up towards Lancaster, trying to get to Canada, um, or going up to New Hampshire, I'm sorry, heading up towards Canada. And, and um, I didn't find this out till a little bit later, but this guy who's just, you know, one Sunday morning, you know, a little bit earlier than church started, I see this guy walking down the street, and he comes walking in, and um, it is very apparent, for those who were here at the time, it was very apparent that this guy had had um, not alcohol, but another substance that was making him kind of funny acting. Um, and I, I don't know what it was, but he was definitely under the influence of something. And I remember this because I was, I was preaching and, and I was sharing, and, and the truth is, is this, this man had a very distinct odor to him. He had been walking for several days, hitchhiking, probably had been a week, two, maybe three without a shower. It might have been a month from, you know, the proximity. I mean, I could smell him from here. Um, just being honest. But, but um, one of the things that was particularly incredible to me is that, that, you know, with the people that we had here, this gentleman was sitting back here, note, back there, noticeably under the influence of something, and noticeably dirty, noticeably um, in tattered clothes, noticeably there was a problem that, that, that anybody, everybody could see. But no one asked him to go anywhere. No one asked him to leave. No one looked at him and thought, man, this guy should have uh, addressed himself before he walked into a church, before he, you know, got, I mean, he should have got himself together, maybe got a shower and a haircut, and, um, you know, fixed himself up before he walked into the building. Now, I, I tell you that story because there are a lot of churches that I've been to, a lot of um, different religious experiences that I've had, that I've had conversations with, that people fear that if they aren't put together before they come into church, they're not going to be accepted. And that, what, what that does is it begins to, it begins to not just be the church, it, it begins to not just be uh, a group of religious people, they begin to attach that belief system to God himself. And they begin to, to, to adopt a belief system that says, well, God won't accept me unless I've got my act together. And somewhere along the line, we started to act like Pharisees. Just being completely transparent with you today. 
The Pharisees had a group of laws, laws that God had set in place in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments being one of the, mo- the, the most critical of them. And there were all these different things that they put together. And then you get to this point where Jesus comes to do his thing. He does something incredible. Everything changes. And we begin to adopt a new understanding of faith because of Jesus dying on the cross, resurrecting, and bringing us into the family, though we weren't the Jews, God's chosen people. And we had this new, powerful, significant Christian faith. And then over the years... We began to attach things to it. Well, it's got to be this way, or it's got to be this way. You got to be dressed this way. You got to look this way. You got to appear this way. In order to be a Christian, you have to have it put together. You have to have it put all together. Now, in Mark 7, 1 through 8, we see something. I'll read the whole text. I, I, have, I don't know if it'll, it'll work, but I have the last verse up there, one of the last verses up there on the screen. But in Mark 7 through 8, they were so adamant about things being just right that they had um, special orders in washing their hands. And starting with verse 1, it says, One day some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived in Jerusalem to see Jesus. And, and they noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand-washing before eating. <gasps> I mean, I know we tell our kids to wash their hands. Um, but Lord, please <laughs> wash your hands, children. Sometimes with a little more alliteration and loudness. Anyway, um, but, and so in verse 3, it, it says, The Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands as required by the ancient tradition. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they immerse their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions that they, had, uh, they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers and kettles. Can you imagine, for those of you who wash, wash your, your dishes, okay, so the kettle's dirty, all right, time to get to it, okay, all right, here's the list of things, please, Lord, I know I don't want to be condemned, I don't want to go to hell, so let me get these 12 things straight, and so you start washing your kettle, and you're like, okay, I'm all the way through, shoot, I missed step three, go all the way back and begin to wash your They were so adamant about their traditions that it created major problems. In verse 5, it says, So the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law asked him, Why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. I know this sounds absurd, but I mean, this is the way they live. And in verse 6, Jesus said this, You hypocrites. (laughs) You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, and he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. In Mark seven twenty or seven thirteen in the in the mess or in the ESV it says this: thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. There was a major problem. Their traditions had become so enormous and so much a part of their culture that the actual text, the actual Bible, had been hidden by all these things they had to do. The very Word of God, the very precious, living Word of God that changed everything was not seen because of all the things that they had attached, all the things that they had put around it. Now, in the dictionary, this is how it defines religion. Religion is seen as the belief in a God or in a group of gods, an organized system of beliefs, ceremonies and rules used to worship a God or a a group of gods, a personal set of institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices, or a cause, principle, or system of beliefs held to with order or ardor and faith. And so my question to you this morning is, is that all we are? 
a personal set of institutionalized system or religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices? Are we an institutionalized group of people that have an idea of, of certain beliefs and practices that we uh, abide by? Now, I know that, I know that there, are, there are beliefs and practices that we follow. I know that that is part of our tradition, and tradition is important. Tradition is a part of who we are. But there is major issues when the significant tradition um, in, in not being inherently bad becomes the focal point of our life. That's when things go bad. When, when, when tradition begins to stagnate faith, when tradition begins to make us powerless, if I could say it this way, a performance-based Christianity will sap you of every drop of joy you ever had. It will suck it all out of you. It is misery. It is misery. I've told you guys this before. Thankfully, I've been in recovery for six years now, but I am a recovering Pharisee. I was as legalistic as they come. I was... Don't ask my wife. I was a difficult person to live with because I just had certain rules that everybody had to abide by. It made me miserable. It made people around me miserable. I was terrified that if I didn't follow the set criteria that had been handed down to me by so-called spiritual mentors, that I would not gain entrance into God's kingdom, that I would not be good enough. It causes a lack of true joy. There is no real victory over sin because you never feel like Christ's sacrifice in resurrection is enough. Because you're trying to be good enough, you are, you are telling him that, that, that you've got it. And you're not embracing his free gift that has released you completely. You don't have a revelation of his unconditional love. You're critical of yourselves and even others. You have a bondage tradition to, to tradition instead of allowing tradition to enrich your faith. Now, I know traditions enriches faith, but, but if that tradition begins to take a tight hold on you, it can cause serious problems. Legalism and religion of this kind is toxic. It creates little assurance in its, in its, it, its context. But Jesus came, if I could say it like this, Jesus came to put religion in its place. He came to put religion in its place. Now, I'm reading from the message translation, but in Matthew 5, 17 through 19, this is where Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. Now, if you look in 17 through 18, um, in, in the uh, message translation, he says this, don't suppose for a minute that I've come to demolish the scriptures, either God's law or the prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to put it all together. I, I love how he phrases this. I'm going to put it all together like, like, like a vast, in a vast pan panorama. God's law is more real and lasting than the stars in the sky. And the ground at your feet, long after stars burn out and earth wears out, God's law will be alive and working. It is in Jesus that we find meaning of it all. Jesus boiled it down to two critical statements, to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and everything else, and to love people as yourself. He summed it up that way. Jesus became as a voice declaring all that the law was, and he opened those who followed him's minds to this vast idea, this big thought, like, like a panorama to me speaks of this wide picture that gives you the whole view. And he opened it up. He came to complete it. He came to finalize it. He put it all together. He gave those who follow him, he gives those who continue to follow him a wider view for greater clarity. In Jesus Christ, we begin to discover in greater ways that the word is indeed alive. It is not an old text of ritual 
that does nothing for us. In John 14, 6, I love this verse. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I absolutely love and pray every day that my love grows with intensity. The chase after Jesus. Tag. He tags you. He gives you life. He gives you um, this, this great um, freedom. And then he says, follow me. Come after me. Let's go. Come on. And he's leading the way, and we're following him. And we discover his way. We discover truth. We discover life. And then when we discover just what he offers us in bringing us to his father. Oh, man, such a pursuit, an enjoyable pursuit. In 2 Corinthians 3, 17, it says, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever, when, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. I love how the message puts this as well. Going back to verse 16 and through 18, it says, Whenever, though, they turn face, or turn face God as Moses did, God removes the veil, and there they are, face to face. They suddenly recognize that God is living, personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We're free of it, all of us. Nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of his faith. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. Whew. Don't fall for a graceless Christianity. It's not about organized religious systems. It's about a supernatural, intimate relationship with the Creator God, His perfect and full of love Son, Jesus Christ, and an all-empowering Holy Spirit who leads us. All of who brings us to new, exciting, marvelous things. In Philippians 1, 6, it says, I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Notice what it's saying. I am certain that God who began a good work within you. It's he that began the good work. It's he that started it. It is God who created the space for you to grow. It is God who initiated that change. I understand that we have to take steps forward when he compels us to follow him. I know that even if they're baby steps, we need to proceed when he shows us where to go and what to do. I understand that. But I also understand that it is he that gives us faith. It is he that empowers us by his Holy Spirit. It is he that loved us first. It is he that came to us. It is he that pursued us through his son Jesus so that we could be free. And he began a work and he will finish it. C.S. Lewis once said this, you are what you believe. You are what you believe. If you believe that you are an awful and wretched, irreparable sinner, then that is indeed what you will be. However, if you believe that you are a child of the living God, that's who you will be. If you believe that you are indeed redeemed because of Jesus' love, that's who you will be. If you indeed believe that you have purpose, that there is an intention for God creating you, if you believe that through his resurrection and your rebirth, that there is so much to do, so much to look forward to, so much that you can accomplish, that indeed is who you will be. 
Stop allowing external circumstances and difficulties around you to dictate to you what your mind tells you about you. God has an entirely different definition. You look in his scriptures, you will discover it. You read the text, you will discover it. You will discover in powerful ways just who he says you are. You will discover that when you are anxious, you can cast your anxiety on him. It doesn't have to be yours. You can discover that he is going to take care of you. You can discover that you are his beloved. You can discover just how much he loves you. As I was reading devotions with my children this weekend, all that there is in this world, the animals, the trees, the mountains, all this gloriousness that we look at, even the angels themselves, we are of what is most precious to God. He values us above all. Uttering a t-shirt I've once seen, I'm his favorite. (laughs) You know what? We all can wear that with confidence because we are all his favorite. See, religion says that obedience brings acceptance. The gospel teaches the opposite. Acceptance brings obedience. I now will live out of who I am. I am a child of God. You know what? I'm going to live like a child of God. I am loved by God. I'm going to live like a person who is indeed loved by God. I have been given God's favor, so you know what? I'm going to live out of the favor that I've already been given. Religion says obedience, then acceptance. The gospel says acceptance, so I'm going to obey. You see, religion has the ability to rob us of the love of God. We feel like we are too far gone. We feel like we're not valuable enough. We feel like we'll never attain that, that we'll never have that. You know what the truth is? We are all rotten, we're all wretched, we're all broken. He gives it to us anyway. Because that's God. That's how he works. So don't for a second, if you've accepted Christ, if you have welcomed him into your life, if you have allowed him to take control, don't for a second believe that it can be lost. That your, 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 your trust and your confidence will continue to increase. Your capacity to believe him for all things will grow and grow and grow. Do you have the genuine love of, for the Lord? Are you missing out on God's love? Have you allowed regulation to trump relationship? Are you mean-spirited, especially with yourself? Are you grumpy and judgmental? Are you proud? Are you loveless? Why live like that? Why live like that? Why be controlled by that? In in this series, we're going to continue to talk about how Um, religion affects us and and affects the church and how the church sees the world and all the damage that's been done. And and you know what? I delight in the fact that I am in a church that does not abide by the rules. Understand what I mean by that. It's not easy. All right? Now, I'm not talking about the rules that we need to abide by. Don't misunderstand me, okay? I'm not saying it's a free-for-all. But what I am telling you is that we have, we, we have as churches begin to move forward and we have taken the richness and the wonder of the living word and applied it to our lives and it is changing us. Those are the things that we abide by, not man-made rules. We are free. We are free, so we should live free. Not, not like doing what we want. Understand what I mean. We have been given freedom in Christ. Why would we walk back into a prison? Or why would we trade one prison, the prison that held us and made us contempt against God? Why would we trade the prison of our sinfulness for a prison of legalism and religiosity and crippling Fear that will never be enough. Why do people trade one prison for the next? 
Jesus is not your accuser. Jesus is your friend and your rescuer. Jesus came for you. Just spend time with him. Referencing 2 Corinthians 3.17 again. For the Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. So live free. Enjoy your freedom. Experience the fullness of the freedom He gives you. I tell you what, being released of all that baggage that I had carried around forever for my awful teen years, the mistakes that I had made, even in the beginning stages of my faith and the beginning stages of pastoring, all those things, even the things that I allowed to creep into my life to become pride and tradition in a negative way and religion, all those things that I allowed to cripple me from becoming exactly what God had designed me to be, all of those things God has released me of, and now I am free. Why wouldn't we live out of that freedom? You're free. And why? On earth would we keep that freedom from others? You realize what you have. Why do we, as the song says, hide it under a bushel? Why do we quiet it and say, ah, I'm nervous. I don't know. (laughs) They're going to laugh at me. Let them laugh. Let them laugh. You've been given an opportunity. My grandmother, for whatever reason, decided that a Billy Graham crusade, you know, I don't even think she was really invited. I think she found out he was coming. He was a star, you know. He was, in that day, he was like somebody seen as this, you know, like, ooh, the the America's pastor's coming to Columbus. And she was just like, I gotta go see this guy. I gotta go find him, you know. That's cool. And there were tons and tons of people in this baseball stadium And just like that, freedom, freedom invaded her heart. And I'll tell you this, she was a bitter and awful woman before she found him. And Jesus changed everything. He changed everything. Jesus, I pray right now for revelation. Lord, as we approach this truth, God, may we understand what religion really is. As your word says, there is pure religion. There is true religion in the sense of, um, God, you want us to follow and abide by things that you have told us in your scripture. There are definite, unquestionable truths that we should follow, but not under the restriction of law, not under a control, not under a, a legalistic spirit that makes us miserable and joyless. No, we learn to follow those things out of excitement, out of thrill, out of the freedom that we've been given, that we are even free to die for you. What a joy, what a privilege It is for us to experience the things that we experience in this culture as a result of our faith. But may we never keep the love that you have given us from others. Lord, convict us. How dare any Christian of any part of the world to quiet themselves when they have an opportunity to release to another person the gospel, the good news, the truth that changes everything, that brings freedom. God, may we be relieved 
and released from the control of legalism, of religion, and open to the truth, abiding by every word of the Scripture and discovering what freedom really is. Amen.